Uh, is my screen uh, visible to everybody? Yes, it is. So uh, at the outset, thank you so much to everybody who is here on this panel and uh, to IDEC and for having me here, a uh, uh, minority uh, surgeon amongst all the physicians and uh, esteemed diabetologists and endocrinologists here. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, my talk for today is about pre and post uh, bariatric surgery, what a physician must know. And I would like to compliment uh, Dr. Caroline for doing such a great job. I think she's uh, done most of it. Uh, I'm just going to take it forward from there. These are a few resources that we have created for our patients as well, uh, which are helpful for them after bariatric surgery. Um, so um, coming to obesity, I think uh, all of us as doctors see patients with obesity and uh, myself being a bariatric surgeon, I see them a lot more. And um, they come from a place of deep bias and stigma. It's not only attached to uh, the disease itself. Um, a lot of it comes from, you know, um, the people thinking that obesity probably is in some way self-implicated and self-imposed and hence probably doesn't really deserve to be treated. So that is one of the biggest challenges that we face uh, when we see patients with obesity. And uh, in the last 17 years that I have been uh, dealing with these patients, I think there is only one word that comes to my mind, that they need support in every way. It's not only in terms of treatment, it also means in terms of uh, uh, motivation, in terms of uh, psychosocial support, in terms of everything else. And um, unlike common perception, they need a lot of family support as well. And um, I think the World Health Organization has already recognized obesity as a chronic progressive disease, uh, which results from multiple environmental and genetic factors. Dr. Caroline has already gone through uh, those factors, so I wouldn't be repeating them. Uh, but chronic progressive is something I think which we will understand a lot more than us surgeons. Um, we are used to treating gallbladders and hernias and none of that is chronic progressive. It's, it's treated and done with. But obesity is chronic progressive, just like diabetes and hypertension and cancer and heart disease. And it needs prolonged treatment. And um, chronic illness is defined as a condition that lasts a year or more and requires ongoing medical attention. So whatever therapy we are trying to institute for our patient, whether it is diet and lifestyle modification or it's pharmacotherapy, endoscopic therapy, or even bariatric surgery. I think once a patient is always your patient and it he or she is going to need ongoing medical attention for life. So my presentation will basically cover everything from pre-surgery consultation to myth busting to uh, the long-term issues and how we do the post-operative follow-up and everything else. Now, I think one of the biggest part about surgery is um, as a physician, it would be very confusing to understand who would qualify for surgery. So yes, we definitely have guidelines and uh, we have the Indian guidelines as well. We have the guidelines from Obesity and Metabolic Surgery Society of India. And according to these guidelines, anybody with a BMI more than 35, uh, with or without any presence of uh, comorbidities, would be eligible for uh, a surgical uh, option. Anyone with a BMI more than 30 in the presence of two or more obesity related comorbidities, especially diabetes, would definitely be eligible for surgery. Uh, BMI more than 27.5 with uncontrolled diabetes, uh, despite optimum medical management. So this is a very rare scenario where um, usually patients would be on medical management um, and they have already kind of saturated everything and then they are referred for surgery primarily for diabetes management. Waist circumference again is a very important uh, aspect for us especially in this part of the world in the Asian uh, region in the Asian context it becomes very important because um, we all know that it's a visceral fat which is actually responsible for all the metabolic uh, effects of obesity and um, waist circumference more than 80 centimeters in females and more than 90 centimeters in males, along with type 2 diabetes is again uh, an indication for surgery. When it comes to age criteria, uh, 
the age criteria can be flexible, but generally, according to like guidelines, it's uh, uh, the youngest that we can operate as 18 years of age. Of course, there are reports and there are cases uh, where uh, adolescents or even children younger than 18 years of age have been operated upon, basis the clinical urgency at that time. And uh, anybody up to 65 years of age is definitely eligible, but we see many, many patients who are more than 65 years of age and um, they are medically fit for surgery and if the surgery can improve their quality of life then they can be eligible candidates for surgery um, one requirement is that any patient who is advised bariatric or metabolic surgery must understand and must be motivated to enter a long-term weight management program and should be committed for lifelong follow-up this is something which we need to grill into our patients at the time of uh, pre-surgery consults as well and it's the responsibility of the bariatric team as well to provide a long-term weight management program and follow-up uh, uh, protocol now uh, these are certain contraindications or situations where we may not consider surgery for a patient so anybody who is upfront and says to us that they would be unable to take nutritional supplements or they are averse to taking nutritional supplements wouldn't be a good candidate for bariatric surgery because as we know that any procedure whether it's a sleeve or a gastric bypass we are changing the GI anatomy and uh, every surgery would have a potential for nutritional deficiencies so if a patient is not willing to take nutritional supplements then I think he or she is not a good candidate of course anyone who's medically unfit should not be taken up for a surgery Anyone with a non-stabilized psychiatric disorder, again, is not a good candidate. Anyone who is a chronic smoker, chronic alcoholic, or has drug dependencies, unless they have been through a de-addiction program successfully. So the first step would be to help them to de-addict and then probably consider surgery for them. Uh, anyone with, uh, say, a metastatic cancer or a shorter life expectancy due to any kind of terminal illness. And of course, pregnant women are not eligible for bariatric surgery. Now, recently in the last year, uh, we've had the newer guidelines which have come from the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery in association with the International Federation for the Surgery of Obesity and Metabolic Disorders. So if uh, you all may know that uh, the guidelines that were being used internationally were the NIH guidelines from 1991. And we are in 2023 now, so it's almost been three decades and those guidelines needed revision and uh, uh, they have been revised last year and the BMI cutoff has been reduced for bariatric surgery from 40, which was in the Western uh, countries, to 35 now. So anybody with a BMI of 35, mm -hmm. regardless of presence or absence of any um, comorbidity, would be eligible for bariatric surgery in the Western world as well now. And uh, with comorbidities, it is now between 30 and 35. And for the Asian population, these BMI cutoffs would be 2.5 points lower. So um, what was 35 for us would now become 32.5 and 27.5 uh, would again be eligible for surgery, uh, which may be um, a gray zone where, you know, drugs can also be used and surgery can also be used. And uh, we'll see how it all shapes up in future. And um, uh, of course, I mean, long term results of uh, metabolic and bariatric surgery have consistently demonstrated safety and efficacy and appropriately selected children and adolescents should also be considered for metabolic and bariatric surgery as per the new guidelines. So this was about the eligibility for surgery, but we don't always um, strictly follow the guidelines when we are um, treating our patients and we actually uh, look at many other things um, while we are taking a decision for a surgery or any kind of treatment plan and it is important to know who we are treating i think obesity is a disease where um, it is important to look at the person as a whole and not just a bmi or a waist circumference uh, this is a disease where I see patients who come to us who are practically, uh, who can be termed as disabled because they cannot walk, they can't even walk two steps, they cannot uh, even, you know, uh, help themselves with a glass of water at home. Um, 
this is the kind of image which we see quite frequently during surgery. I mean, these are livers which are um, very nodular, almost bordering on to cirrhosis, severe NASH, and uh, usually not picked up by uh, routine investigations because of the fat, uh, the subcutaneous fat uh, in the patients with obesity. So um, the disease is actually affecting them chronically and progressively without you know being um, very visible from outside it is just like diabetes so how the way diabetes is causing all these chronic issues and leading to a lot of other problems with almost every organ in the body same as the case with obesity these are the kind of uh, lower limbs that we see very very frequently with uh, in our patients um, this is the amount of fat it's like a sea of fat when we go into uh, these abdomens through laparoscopy a lot of non-healing ulcers and uh, like i said i mean um, some of these patients are not able to walk they're not able to do anything on their own they're dependent on their family members for almost everything and it is kind of our job to you know um, help them and safely take them through any kind of treatment plan that we are uh, advising for them so this is in general um, sorry it's a little busy slide but this is the amount of uh, evaluation that is needed this is just the history and examination and the entire diet protocol uh, diet recall and everything that we have to take before uh, uh, during our assessment for bariatric surgery. But some of the key points that we would really want to know is uh, about our patient is uh, what was their highest weight and what is what was their lowest weight. So lowest weight in their adult life tells us basically the point from where they started gaining weight. What is the age of the patient? So age is again a very big deciding factor, especially for me, because if the patient is a senior citizen, I cannot expect uh, a 65 year old lady to go and you know work out in the gym and work on strength training and things like that. This is a lady who has been advised knee replacement by the orthopedic surgeon. How is she going to lose weight or uh, uh, what are the attempts at weight loss? I mean, um, uh, the common perception is that, uh, you know, uh, people are not doing anything and they're kind of, you know, lazy. But unfortunately, and what I see normally is that these are patients who have done everything on the earth. They have tried every diet program. They have uh, been there, done that. And uh, it's important to know the struggle behind uh, their story and why they have finally resorted to uh, an option, a surgical option. Uh, when did the weight start increasing is again very important. Has it been a gradual weight gain? Has there been any life event like an accident or any place where they needed to start taking steroids or um, did they get bedridden at any point in time? Uh, any, any situation which probably may have led to weight gain. Uh, drug history again is very important because there are many drugs uh, which you know better than me that can lead to weight gain. Psychosocial history again is very important. So how, uh, how has this patient been affected? I mean, uh, the patient, there are so many of them who lose their jobs because uh, they just can't work. They can't even move. So how can we expect them to actually go to work? And uh, unless they lose weight, I mean, uh, they really can't do much in life. What is the present quality of life? I think that is one of the most important questions that what kind of a life is this patient leading with this weight? So um, quality of life is very, very important. It is, um, I mean, it's it's really uh, moving to hear their stories about how they lose their jobs, how they're not able to do anything, how they're ostracized by the society, by their own family members. And, you know, uh, parents come with younger children and they, they feel that the children are not doing anything because nobody understands the pathophysiology of obesity. And everybody just feels that these are people who are not taking enough effort to uh, lose uh, that kind of weight. And uh, how many medical admissions have they had? It's amazingly, uh, it's surprising to see the number of medical admissions that they need because of weight related issues. And unfortunately, we see many patients who come for consults, uh, then they would probably wait. And because like Dr. Caroline mentioned that acceptability for medication itself is so low. So you can imagine how it would be for a surgical treatment option. So the acceptability is still very, very low. And we have less than 1% of patients who actually undergo bariatric surgery despite being eligible. 
and uh, these are patients who go back they are kind of uh, uh, told by the society or by their family members to keep trying in the natural way and uh, unfortunately a lot of times they have events um, medical events like um, i mean they would have cardiac failure or they would have any other uh, issues which can lead to multiple medical admissions and eventually they may actually become unfit for surgery as well now these are the standard bariatric operations which are being practiced across the world today out of these the sleeve gastrectomy and the roux and y gastric bypass are probably the commonest procedures which are being uh, done um, sleeve gastrectomy even more common than gastric bypass probably because it's easier it's more physiological and uh, leads to lesser nutritional deficiencies as compared to a roux and y gastric bypass uh, this procedure here is the gastric banding. Uh, at least in India, it is completely out of fashion. We don't do this anymore here because the results were not very good. So last 15 years or so, the band has not been, uh, is not being performed in the country. This is the single anastomosis gastric bypass, um, an upcoming procedure which is um, becoming quite popular with the surgeons as well as patients with decently good results and uh, a little bit easier to perform as compared to the ruin by gastric bypass. Then we have the laparoscopic duodenal switch, uh, which is a very malabsorptive surgery, um, not very commonly performed in our country because um, I don't think our patients can nutritionally cope up with something as malabsorptive as this. And uh, this is a procedure which we would consider only as a revision procedure, even that very, very selectively. So these are the two main procedures. Uh, talking about mechanisms, I think um, um, all the surgeries lead to restriction in uh, reduction in the size of the stomach. So definitely the caloric intake goes down the amount of food that a person can take goes down considerably and um, they feel full very early so the so early satiety is one of the biggest factors third thing is that um, the ghrelin hormone levels go down uh, reducing the amount of hunger that a person can feel so though despite their eating less they're not hungry they're not craving for food and of course the biggest um, hormonal change that surgery brings is an increased uh, GLP level. So GLP-1, uh, PYY and uh, GIP levels increase very uh, considerably after any kind of pediatric surgery, including a sleeve gastrectomy as well. So these are the uh, main mechanisms by which surgery acts. These are certain newer procedures. We call them the sleeve plus procedures. Uh, they are a little bit more complicated, but being performed selectively for a few patients. Now, how do we select which procedure for whom? Uh, a lot of patients would come and ask you that, should I have a sleeve or should I have a gastric bypass? I'm feeling a little bit confused. What should I do? So uh, I have here a comparative chart, uh, which tells us about, um, you know, so the excess weight loss, if you see, is uh, sleeve would have about 65 to 75%, and the gastric bypass would have about 70 to 80%. Uh, remission or improvement of comorbidities, I'm sorry to use the word resolution, it's, it should be improvement, uh, is good in sleeve. It's definitely better with any kind of bypass. Complications, of course, are a part of uh, any kind of surgical procedure. In fact, any kind of treatment has complications, uh, including medications as well. But yes, surgical complications can be a lot more severe. So sleeve uh, has uh, complications like leaks or acid reflux and malic esophagus in certain cases. In a gastric bypass, of course, leaks can be there, uh, but we can also have marginal ulcers or internal herniation in the long term. Learning curve for a sleeve is much shorter for the surgeon per se. It is much longer for uh, a ruined by gastric bypass as compared to a sleeve. And hence, uh, I mean, uh, the popularity of sleeve is not very surprising. Nutritional deficiencies, definitely because sleeve is a more physiological procedure, we are not bypassing the gut. So nutritional deficiencies are lesser in a sleeve as compared to a bypass. And uh, a sleeve would be contraindicated for anybody with GERD or hiatus hernia. So in my mind, any patient with hiatus hernia is definitely a, not a candidate for a sleeve gastrectomy. So that is one of the most major deciding factors for us when we decide 
about the procedures. And RU and Y gastric bypass actually would be the treatment of choice for a patient with hiatus hernia and GERD. Now, weight regain, um, like we all know, is the biggest uh, bane of any treatment for obesity. And after a sleep, we see more weight regain as compared to a gastric bypass. Uh, when we talk about weight regain, we also talk about revision surgery and the options for revision are much more after a sleeve gastrectomy as compared to a gastric bypass. Now, sleeve is also endoscopically accessible to us unlike a gastric bypass where we are bypassing the stomach and hence we cannot access it within endoscopy. So in, in countries like Korea where gastric cancer is very common, uh, sleeve gastrectomy is the preferred procedure because it would always be available for surveillance. And of course, when we talk about reversibility, a sleeve would be irreversible because we're removing a part of the stomach, whereas technically a gastric bypass is a reversible procedure. So if we see over here, um, as the weight loss increases, um, when with increasing weight loss, we get increasing improvement in, uh, in comorbidities, but we also get um, increase in nutritional deficiencies. So sleeve has the least amount of nutritional deficiencies and the duodenal switch and the one in anastomosis gastric bypass would have a lot more nutritional deficiencies. So after all this, I think um, during consults, one of the major concerns that patients have are <laughs> regarding the myths about uh, bariatric surgery and uh, these weight loss treatments. One of the biggest um, one which I hear is uh, from patients when they come and tell us that surgery is an unnatural way of losing weight. Uh, we, everybody's family wants them to lose it the natural way. They want them to just stick to diet and lifestyle modification or go to the gym or take a crash diet and just, you know, try to lose weight by that. And I think we need to remember here that every disease has a grading and a staging, including obesity. Maybe it's not as formalized as, uh, as cancer as yet but we have to treat the disease as per its stage. We cannot treat stage four with diet and lifestyle modification and neither can we treat stage one with surgery. So this is what we need to inform our patients. Uh, they also feel that after bariatric surgery, they will never be able to enjoy food again, which is again a myth because most of our patients are actually able to eat uh, quite normally within a year or year and a half. They're able to cherish uh, most kinds of foods. Of course, there has to be moderation in diet. Uh, a lot of them think that they will become weak. And the answer to that is that follow up is the key to good uh, long term outcomes and nutritional supplementation is a must. Uh, without that, definitely there will be some weakness. So they need to be counseled about this before undergoing for surgery. A lot of people feel that they're going to die during surgery. And uh, I think uh, surgery has evolved a lot more. Uh, we are in 2023 and things have become much safer. Um, the mortality after bariatric surgery is very, very low. Um, they also feel that they will probably vomit after eating anything and they tend to have these conversations with people who've undergone surgery. And they, these patients need to be counseled very well before undergoing surgery about the quantity of food, the measures that they can take and uh, how they should be eating. And that is done by a team of dietitians. A uh, lot of patients think that they might become thin immediately after surgery. So when they come out of the theater, they would probably look like uh, 50 kgs lesser, which is again something that they need to be counseled about, that it's a long process. It takes about a year. Hair fall is one of the important aspects. Uh, they feel that hair fall would be like chemotherapy, which is not the case. Yes, there is thinning of hair during the active weight loss phase between three to eight months, but then it does come back and uh, usually by the end of one year they have their hair back. A lot of people feel that they will look very old and haggard and uh, we still are uh, kind of uh, trying to bust the myth that bariatric surgery is not plastic surgery, it's not cosmetic, it's not liposuction. And again the last one that it may lead to impotency or infertility, in fact I think bariatric surgery is done on a lot of patients with infertility to help them to deal with infertility and to conceive and it works really well. So these are the available treatment options, um, which is these four mainly. So you have diet and lifestyle modification, drug therapy, endoscopic intervention, and bariatric surgery. But what we need to explain to our patients is that monotherapy may not work for every patient. 
Uh, we need to see what stage of the disease the patient is at. If a patient is say 75 kilos, definitely diet and lifestyle modification will probably work alone. But at 90 kgs, he may need diet and lifestyle modification with drug therapy. An escalation of therapy may be needed. If the person is already 140 kilos, then bariatric surgery would probably be the option to go in for. And we need combination therapy. There cannot be one thing which will, bariatric surgery alone cannot uh, treat the entire disease, right? So this will need to be bariatric surgery plus diet and lifestyle modification. I may need to use drugs as well after bariatric surgery for weight maintenance. And there has to be titration as per response to treatment. So exactly like diabetes. So when the HbA1c increases, we increase the intensity of the treatment. And if everything is under control, we can bring the intensity of treatment back to what it was. So titration has to be done as per response to treatment. There is no one-time treatment for obesity. And like I have been uh, emphasizing, the treatment is going to be lifelong. When a patient is coming for surgery, I think it is very important to set the right expectations because we need to educate our patients about what they're getting into. And terminologies that need to go away from our vocabulary are cure. Nothing can cure obesity as of now. I think we are very far away from that. Um, it is a very, very complex disease. And uh, I know this is a very exciting time to be um, in this field. A lot of uh, treatment, a lot of um, innovation is happening. and. I think it makes us all feel very empowered, but cure is not a word that has that can be in our dictionary at the moment. Failure is again a term which should go away from our um, vocabulary because um, uh, weight regain is not failure of treatment. Um, sometimes the disease can be a lot more powerful. And I mean, we see it all the time in diabetes and hypertension and cardiac disease that sometimes Everything may be doing, everybody may be doing everything right, the doctor is doing everything right, the patient is doing everything right, and yet the disease progresses. So it's not, it cannot be termed as failure. Uh, there is no ideal treatment, uh, there is no one treatment, there is no gold standard treatment, and there are no undesirable results per se. Terminologies that we need to include when we are managing obesity is that it is a chronic progressive condition. This is something that we need to educate our patients about. Whatever we do, we are trying to put the disease into remission or control. We may need adjuvant therapy. Uh, it is not as formalized as it is in cancer because their surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, everything has to go hand in hand depending upon what kind of cancer it is. Same is going to be the case with obesity in future where uh, probably uh, pharmacotherapy or endoscopic therapy or some combination of bariatric surgery may be needed. Uh, hence, the treatment has to be comprehensive. Compliance is the biggest word that is, I think, needed for any chronic progressive disease. If our patients are not compliant or if we are not able to develop tools to make compliance easy for them, I think we will find it very, very challenging to treat these patients. Support is the next word. I started my presentation with support, and I think that is one of the main uh, pillars of treatment. We need to look at treatment outcomes in terms of five-year outcomes. Uh, one treatment cannot last for a lifetime. In cancer, also, you have five-year five outcomes, and uh, we need to acknowledge that these are diseases which will have recurrence, which will have some degree of regain, and that will need to be dealt with eventually. And Care has to be bi-directional like in any other chronic disease. It cannot be only the doctor's job to treat these patients. The onus also has to be on the patient. And in fact, I think we need a whole village to treat patients with obesity. When we talk about pre-operative investigation, there is a whole comprehensive list. But like I said, the two main procedures, sleeve and bypass and upper GI endoscopy along with clinical um, uh, symptoms and signs would be one of the most deciding factors for choosing um, a bariatric procedure. Uh, one other factor which we need to take into consideration is also patient's wish. What What is the procedure that patient wants to have? Because we cannot ignore the fact that our patients today are very educated and they do a lot of research before coming in. So it is important for us to take their wish into account and have a mutual discussion, guide them about the pros and cons, and then make a decision. 
pre surgery preparation is uh, these are the basically um, the goals so there is a pre surgery diet and we do focus on pre surgery weight loss uh, which is mainly to improve the liver health and to decrease the visceral fat so that it makes the surgery easy um a lot of importance is laid on treatment of nutritional deficiencies because unlike common perception obesity uh, is also a state of malnutrition and we see a large number of um, nutritional deficiencies like vitamin d3 vitamin b12 iron deficiency uh, calcium folic acid and so on so these have to be treated well before in time uh, before we take the patient on table unlike other surgeries where you know you see the patient one day and operate the next day it doesn't go like that for bariatric surgery uh, patients of course need to have their fitness consultations and um, uh, one important aspect is to treat them for sleep apnea because that is very important it really has a lot of bearing on our post operative outcomes and teach them breathing exercises etc so the whole goal of um, optimization is that um, the better we optimize the better are the post operative outcomes and lesser are the chances of complications uh, later this is a whole range of uh, comorbidities that improve after bariatric surgery which is very um, uh, dependent on weight loss and as our patients lose weight uh, i think everything improves uh, including their uh, metabolic syndrome which is almost 80% improved um, diabetes hypertension risk of um, um, heart disease everything goes down now we see a lot of improvement in uh, in fertility as well uh, gerd if the right procedure is done a uh, lot of improvement in polycystic ovarian disease uh, there is 89% reduction in overall mortality and most patients actually experience a very marked improvement in quality of life after weight loss complication of course nobody likes them and nobody wants to have them but as a surgeon i would be lying if uh, i say that there are no complications at all so yes complications can happen they can happen after any surgery we need to inform our patients before uh, during our counseling that what are the common complications but the overall risk of complications is less than 2% i think it's much lesser than that this includes minor and major complications the uh, risk of major complications would be much lesser than that uh, today we have much better technology uh, we have a lot more experience now with bariatric surgery and uh, i think surgery has been around for more than half a century now and laparoscopy has definitely made it better and we also have more experience in managing complications now so um, it is not very common for us to have a mortality after bariatric surgery anymore so when patients come asking about complications i think that is one of the biggest things that they really want to be clear about so we need to i think guide them about two things that i always tell them that you have to see it with a different perspective first you need to realize that what are you dealing with what is the disease what is how much obesity you have and in the long term what are the complications that are expected because of this weight and what would be your life expectancy and then you have to see what are the complications of surgery is the risk worth taking so if the pros and cons have to be weighed properly before going in for surgery but we need to give them that um birds eye view about all the problems that can happen because of their weight as well um so it is when we talk about post operative care this is all about pre op consultation um i just have about a couple of slides more i think post operative care it's very important to keep the goal in sight so definitely good weight loss is what we are aiming at uh but uh along with improvement in comorbidities we also want our patients to become better in terms of their um, glycemic control in terms of their hypertension cardiac risk and everything else but we also don't want to harm our patients uh in the sense that we want to prevent all kinds of nutritional deficiencies and hence importance of follow up is very very high in bariatric surgery uh we must keep addressing their common concerns through support group meetings through one on one consultations and um, any um, i mean till we have technology to reach out to our patients at the uh, touch of a screen and one thing which we have to focus on is basically good quality of life so it's not about just chasing weight loss 
uh, there would be patients who would be happy with 20 kgs weight loss and they're happy to move around and you know uh, do their uh, things independently and um, of course goals are different for each patient so obesity management is beyond bariatric surgery alone it's not just about surgery um, so we need to have a very stringent follow-up we need to have repeated counseling sessions because uh, surgery is a one-time thing but to be able to maintain the weight loss to be able to avoid any kind of deficiencies to become more fit to become more uh, disciplined and uh, you know to be able to give them tools to be compliant i think repeated counseling sessions are very important in the post operative care and that is where i think our physician colleagues are very important because the patients are definitely more comfortable with their physicians and uh, they can become a big part of this and they need a lot of motivation for sustained lifestyle modification and we need to keep doing things and keep giving them uh, tricks and techniques to increase compliance not only for uh, supplementation but also for lifestyle modification and willingness to seek help so uh, if if the uh, i've had patients who've not come to us uh, because they have regained weight because they feel that we will get upset with them that why have they regained weight again implying that it is their responsibility alone to maintain their weight loss so we have to tell them that yes this is this is natural progression of the disease and this will happen when this happens you need to come and seek help again so goal of bariatric surgery is definitely not just to lose weight or to chase any number of weight loss or any percentage or 30% 40% but it is basically to prevent future obesity related complications and to provide a better quality of life to our patients uh these are just a few patients i think um, i i am very um happy with results of bariatric surgery especially in our older patients because it really changes their life and one of the biggest things that they uh, appreciate in life after losing weight at that age is independence uh, these are women who are 65 plus and they had surgery and initially they couldn't get out of the house and today 3 uh, 4 5 years later it's hard to keep them back in the house it also works very well in patients with disability so this is a lady who had uh, polio and uh, she was um, completely immobile uh, because of the weight she couldn't even use the crutches and now after surgery of course now she's much uh, much thinner and much lighter even than she is in this picture uh, these are some other patients so uh, last slide surgery is also now covered under insurance in india it's been a very big step for us and for our patients because um, the cost was one of the biggest uh, barriers to um, seeking help uh, with surgery and uh, now almost every insurance company is covering it of course they are following the the age old nih criteria of bmi more than 40 but uh, something is better than nothing for our patients so in the end i would just like to say that um, uh, a lot is happening in this field um we have newer treatments coming up uh, we have newer drugs coming up and that makes us feel very empowered um but again the problem is not about having the treatment available that was one aspect of it but it is also about taking it to the right uh, the needy patients and we also need to set the right expectations when it comes uh, about surgery so Uh, surgery is not a shortcut it's not an easy way out it's one of the hardest uh, things to do for any person and um, surgery is not the end it's the beginning of their journey obesity is a chronic disease and it needs to be treated like one it, we need to probably borrow uh, tips and tricks from our diabetes diabetes and uh, cardiac colleagues and sometimes we may be doing everything right but the disease may be too aggressive and uh, we really can't do much about it at that time but we have to keep trying and obesity is in a very nascent stage even today it is an evolving science and we are learning every day and hopefully we will be able to do better by our patients in the future so thank you very much and uh, i will uh, stop sharing my screen now thanks a lot thank you aparna